So we're going to talk about the permaculture ethics. Um, does anyone know what the what the ethics of permaculture are? Have you, have you heard what they are before? Come on, shout, shout out if you've heard of them. Fair share. Fair share? Fair share. Okay, yep, yeah, fair share. And what does that, what does that mean? Is there more? Um, you can explain it in different ways. That depends. <laughs> you can explain it in different ways. I'd say uh, setting up boundaries, limit consumption, okay. uh, and share your everything you've got extra. Okay. Yeah. So it's about um, yeah basically that. Marshalling your own consumption, thinking about how much stuff you actually need to use in life. So there's this uh, idea of there's enough for everyone's need, not for everyone's breed. And if we just take what we need and if we've got surplus, redistribute it to other people. Okay, everyone happy with that definition? Fair shares. Okay, so I'm going to um, draw a circle. Um, does that look like a set of scales? <laughs> okay, so um, Earth Care, yeah? Let's just draw a little picture of the Earth. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. That can be off the curve. Right, earth care, great. And the final one? People, people, people care, great. Okay. So let's do a little person. Right, so we've got this simple ethical framework. So, and this is really where permaculture starts from. It starts from, this is the, the foundation We've got this idea that we want to look after people. So we're all people and we kind of quite like as a species to continue. We like to have a permanent culture. In order for that to happen, we kind of need to look after our home so we've got somewhere that continues to provide our needs. So people care really depends on, on that caring for the earth. And then this fair shares or redistributing resources only taking what we need really supports these two aims. So only taking what we need means that we don't completely trash the planet and so therefore humans can continue to exist. Yeah? You all happy with that? Okay. okay. One of the things that for me makes permaculture um, uh, quite distinctive is that it, that it starts with this ethical framework. Um, so Another design system like architecture doesn't say architecture has to be for the benefit of people and for the planet, whereas permaculture explicitly has this, this framework. And it's um, deliberately simple, so um, it's simple and generic so that nearly every belief system on the planet can be compatible with this. It's not particularly controversial to say we want people to continue to exist. It's not particularly controversial to say the planet needs to still exist for people to exist. It's arguably more controversial to say we should redistribute our surplus in a capitalist society. So you could argue it's um, explicitly political in that it says we should redistribute resources. But um, on the whole, most religious belief systems um, and, uh, and non-religious, so humanist movement would, would not have too much difficulty in um, working with this ethical framework. Um, the other key thing for me is that um, it gives us a set of tools to aid our thinking. It doesn't give us a set of rules. So it doesn't say, you can do this, you can't do that. It says, here's a kind of framework that can support the way you think about your make your decisions and the way you think about your actions. Okay, so I'm going to hand out a set of cards now. I'm going to give you each um, at least one, yeah, I'll give each one card. And we're going to just look at these topics and see how they might relate to the um, permaculture ethics. Okay, so we've got. I've got flying. Flying, right, okay. Where do we think that goes in this framework? 
I don't think it's Earth care. Okay. How come? Um, that's pretty polluting way of travelling. Yeah. Um, Carbon emissions. Yeah, and so it's probably not very fair share because you're losing like a lot of resources. But it can be people care because it means that you get places quicker and you can go on holiday and have a nice tan. Yeah. So I would say that it's sort of here. Yeah. I'm eating meat. Eating meat, right, okay. Oh. And what do you think about that? How does uh, it fit in with this framework? Uh, well, I think that, um, yeah, it, well, it has something to do with all of these. Uh, it's not particularly healthy to eat a lot of meat, so it's not part of caring people. So at least you could reduce that. But it's also exploiting the, the resources if you have intensive um, animal husbandry. Uh, it uses much more resources than, than vegetarian diet. So, so care for earth, it's maybe not the best way to have your diet. What about arguments for meat? Um, it does give more diverse ecosystem. Sure, we can manage yeah. uh, a lot more nature if we use animals and uh, and also we got a lot of heirloom breeds that we would lose if we stopped eating them. Which yep. is a bit of a shame. Mm. I'm a carnivore. <laughs> <laughs> Very passionately. I've got one here which is fair trade bananas. What do you think? <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, bananas are usually harvested long before they're ripe and then they're usually shipped okay. to Europe. Usually, most bananas that come from the Caribbean to Europe are shipped. So. Well, often they are careful people because I, I find they, the, how they produce it, they also take into account the use of pesticides and the, the fair conditions for workers. To me it would mean fair share that you eat and produce, produce locally. The bananas are definitely not in Denmark at least. Mm. Or only you might eat them for Christmas or something. Like for your birthday. You have yeah. banana. <laughs> How do you actually use them on a day to day basis? Do you like go to the supermarket and then sort of have to sort of do like a checklist? You don't get to the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've often found myself standing with um, a, bunch of, bananas. a bunch of fair trade bananas in one hand and a bunch of organic bananas in the other hand going, ah, people care, earth care. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, and so I find often I'm alternating. I'm buying, you know, one time I go and buy fair trade, the next time I'll get organic. But I guess the key thing is that I'm consuming consciously. I'm thinking about my choices much more. And eat um, less bananas. Yeah. And eat <laughs> more. Yes, make you stop. Yeah. Grow my own apples instead. Of them. Yeah. Um, so hopefully this will help you to make informed choices in the future, um, and it will be a useful framework for you and your permaculture design will all reflect and we'll all be completely here in the middle and you'll be awesome permaculture designers at the end of this course. Okay, yeah, organic food, local food, renewable energy systems, transition towns, food banks. There might initially be a kind of name game, getting to know your icebreaker, but yeah, in the first morning of the course, um, try and get this in. Um, cause it, and I do that to try and highlight the importance of the ethics to permaculture. Um, it introduces, if you've got people on the course who are like super eco and they know all this stuff, that's great. But if you, you'll often have quite a diversity and some people, they might not have heard of um, uh, transition towns, for example. So this session is a great way of um, introducing all those topics and, and elucidating a definition from the group um, and it examines a lot of kind of eco sacred cows so um, so a lot of controversial topics like eating meat flying nuclear energy these debates often uh, GM 
crops, for example. These um, are often sacred cows in the, in the ecological movement, and I think it's really healthy for there to be ongoing debate about all these issues, um, and to highlight that there's a range of views on them. <coughs> and the permaculture isn't going to tell you what you can, what you can, can't do, or what you should and shouldn't do. Um, Uh, and then the way I teach it is um, I do like very little quick introduction at the start and try and get the students to tell me if they've heard of what the ethics are and then sort of come up with a definition together. Um, uh, and that instantly starts to create a culture of um, building a learning community and getting people talking to each other and sharing what they already know. So in that little discussion there, there are views and opinions about about intensive um, meat production, for example. Um, so when you've got a really knowledgeable student body, just get them contributing from the beginning, get them comfortable teaching each other. Um, everyone gets a card so that everyone gets to participate. Everyone gets a voice at a session that's very early in the course, but it's not, they don't have to get up and stand at the front and talk to everyone and do like a sort of public speaking thing. But everyone, everyone's voice and opinion was heard. Um, it's low tech, so all I need is some paper and a piece of chalk. Or you could use found objects, you could use like scarves to create the circles, or bits of electrical cable, you know, whatever. Um, and yeah, I'm always asking the students what they think and getting them to contribute and get them engaged so that they're not sitting there passively just um, receiving information. Um, so yeah, and I tried to get consensus around, um, around topics, even though obviously sometimes you forget it, it's not gonna, not gonna happen. Um, because I try to set up that dynamic of not, it not being about me telling people what the answer is, it's about people figuring out for themselves and working in the community to work out what we actually think. Because um, I, I, I think as a permaculture teacher it's really dangerous to set yourself up at the beginning as the person who knows everything and has all the answers. Because there's too much to, to learn or to know in permaculture, you can't possibly have all the answers. So, um, yeah, that's why I do it the way I do. Thank you.